In the U.S. today, approximately 400,000 youth experience foster care at any given time, with nearly 8,000 youth experiencing foster care in Washington State alone. The purpose of foster care is to create stability for youth when there is a breakdown in the family structure. The work is not easy. Stable housing, the child's welfare, family support, and especially education all need to be considered and managed. Throughout this film, we will explore the ups and downs of foster care by focusing on the real-life stories from individuals who navigated these roadblocks, and we'll hear about some promising steps to help youth in our state. In 2021, Washington reached a significant milestone in supporting the education of youth experiencing foster care. I'm talking about Senator Twina Nobles and Senate Bill 5184. To be here, and I have absolutely come a long way from experiencing foster care. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Nobles is an alumni of foster care, and now she's making significant changes in writing legislative bills. Bill 5184 is a powerful start to addressing the needs of these students. The law requires school staff to know which students were in foster care and fully understand their rights under state and federal law. Treehouse plays a unique role as a connector, influencer, and advocate for our youth. We're bridging the gap between DCYF and OSPI, two critical systems that have an incredible impact on youth in foster care. Our mission is to work towards a 90% graduation rate by 2027 and critical support for the 10% that do not complete formal high school programs. More than 7,800 people are served by Treehouse programs each year. And what's remarkable about our youth as they experience foster care is how resilient they are. We'll feature several alumni of foster care in our film, and you'll have a chance to meet Erica, Shirley, Connor, Sam, and Alex. As these individuals grew up, they were determined to overcome obstacles related to the instability of their home and school. Building relationships with foster parents, teachers, and schoolmates proved to be a formidable challenge. And yet, in case after case, these young people thrived. You'll see that self-determination, that spirit, and the will to overcome obstacles that led to personal progress. The alumni in our film developed coping skills, self-awareness, and self-confidence, even as they experienced uncertainty in their home life. But what if we could remove those obstacles and make the experience of foster care as beneficial and as painless as possible so that even more youth could succeed. In this film, Treehouse will convene conversations with knowledgeable people about how we can do just that, and will highlight success stories from our very own youth who have experienced foster care. But to understand how we got there, first, let's roll the clocks back through history. Around 1830, a large population of homeless children emerged in big cities. Children were orphaned after their parents died in epidemics or were neglected due to poverty. In 1853, Charles Loring Brace founded a program that would become the foundation of modern-day foster care. In the Pacific Northwest, treaties negotiated with indigenous groups during the 1850s included promises of free educational support for our tribes. By 1902, 2,200 students were enrolled in 400 day and boarding schools. 25 of those schools were built near reservations and run primarily by religious organizations. And some 100,000 Native Americans were forced to attend these schools. The federal government engaged in a cultural assimilation campaign by forcing Native American children to abandon their Native identities, forbidding them to speak Native languages and forcing them to renounce their Native beliefs. Now fast forward to 1930, and most off-reservation boarding schools were closed as a result of a 1928 investigative report that was commissioned by the Interior Department, which condemned the conditions of Native American boarding schools. But by then, the damage had been done. A generation later, and children in family foster care outnumbered children in institutions for the first time. And by 1960, there were more than twice as many in foster care. Race as well as class marked the growing gap between foster care and adoption. During the post-war civil rights era, 
Poor children of color, formerly denied many services, were often labeled delinquent and compromised more of the foster care caseload. And by the late 1970s, the foster child population exceeded 500,000, and that's roughly where it stands today. Halfway through the first decade of the 21st century, the Washington State Legislature created a program that enabled youth who turned age 18 to remain in foster care until the age of 21. And on average, 440 young people each year turn 18 while in foster care. And in 2019, 562 young adults enrolled in extended foster care. From its earliest days, the child welfare system often removed children from families just because they were poor. And today, just 9% of white people compared to 21.2% of black people and 24.2% of indigenous people were living in poverty in Washington state. High poverty rates mean that these families are less likely to have access to necessary resources such as stable housing, counseling, and child care services, without which they may be determined to be neglectful by the child welfare system. I've had a lot of highs and lows in foster care. I am actually a Muckleshoot tribal member. My experience in foster care has been different in terms of not dealing directly with Washington State. Since we are a sovereign nation, a lot of what I've been through was through them. I am one sibling of eight and I'm the middle child, so around the time that I was born, I had three older siblings, and that by far was probably one of the best benefits while being in foster care was having my siblings and you know other family members to rely on. I'm still currently experiencing foster care, and there are um, a lot of uh, challenges when it comes to being in foster care, just in general. Most of them are location-based, depending on where you're going to school, whether or not you're in a shelter or a foster home. I felt like I was just going through all of those challenges by myself um, until I learned that there was actually people that wanted to care for me. And I had a lot of trust issues with a lot of people. For me personally, I've had a lot more challenges just because I'm um, LGBTQ, uh, because I'm uh, at the time, while I was going through the beginnings of foster care, I had undiagnosed ADHD and undiagnosed autism. I grew up in a lot of different homes. I was moved a lot. I had three brothers and they tried to keep us together for most of the time. But there were times that four of us in one, one home was a bit too much. So mostly my experience in the foster care system was moving from home to home, um, packing everything in garbage bags and just kind of never knowing where we're going to land. So I think that any person that moves that much struggles with trying to feel safe in their environment. When I was taken out of my original home, it was pretty scary. It was kind of terrifying. I, there, I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know where I was going. I didn't know anything about foster care. I faced um, a couple forms of abuse. I had to face those challenges alone. I believe I was around eight years old when I pretty much knew that being in foster care was one of the things that was unique about me and uh, I had to do things a little bit differently and I was looked at differently. When you're in the system, there are a lot of assumptions about you. As a group, as we're, people are changing and evolving, the LGBTQI plus community, I really feel like uh, they're not being seen as individuals within the foster care system. So I am a transgender man, I use he, him pronouns, and going through foster care as a transgender person is very difficult because foster care itself, shelters, foster homes, they're all gendered. The lack of any sort of specific uh, homes that help LGBTQ youth. 
when you're transgender and going through foster care, everyone is screaming at you that your birth sex is what matters the entire time. There is a huge discrepancy in how the people who fall through the cracks get served. And that's what we need to be paying attention to, right? I really see one of the barriers of having safe uh, foster homes for these young adults and these kids to go to, homes that will uh, rise them up and uh, talk about who they are and really like glorify that and help them feel like that who they are is okay. There's the boy side and then there's the girl side. And I was always put on the girl side. There was nothing that anyone could do for me to make it um, less obvious. Like the foster parent only knew how to take care of girls and they were never really educated on what to do when you have someone who is transgender. And so that was very mentally draining on me. can't fix these systems without acknowledging that they're inherently racist. You know, we really need to address racial equity and trauma-informed practice in every element of our foster care system and also at school. If we have a young person, you know, of color who needs an iPad to be able to make it through third period, um, we don't necessarily get that, but in other places young people do. Um, and in non-BIPOC you know, non communities, they do receive those supports and services. Youth in foster care perform worse on every educational measure that we look at, from attendance to grades to test scores, um, graduation rates. You know, add to that um, racism and homophobia that our BIPOC and LGBT youth experience, and you see significantly disparate um, outcomes or disproportionate outcomes for our BIPOC and our LGBTQ youth. Just in general, it's extremely difficult to become a foster parent if you're LGBTQ. But because there are no foster parents that are LGBTQ, there are no safe spaces for transgender kids like me. I think oftentimes there's a moral judgment around the supports that we provide BIPOC communities. Um, this idea around who's deserving of resources, who deserves direct cash, who deserves direct benefits, right? And what we see now is that people know what they need, right? And that if we give them the supports and the resources, they're gonna be able to manage and, and bring themselves together in the way that they need it the most. So I think part of it is just taking away some of those judgments, some of those stigmas that we place on our BIPOC communities. When I was growing up, I had all of these adults making these decisions for me without including me in the conversation. And the only thing that I was able to take control of was my education. I'm not going to let being a foster kid define who I am. I like to say that for me being a, in high school um, as a senior, it was twice as difficult as any other student. Definitely a lot of stress, uh, wanting to graduate high school, um, and wanting to go to college, um, which I was able to do. Um, but it definitely took a lot of hard work um, from my behalf and from people around me. I went to several different schools before I was put into foster care and before I went to high school. And when I got to high school, my one goal was to graduate and attend one high school throughout the entirety of those four years. And every time a, a youth moves a new home, most often they have to move to a new school. And so the really great thing about Treehouse is we really try to keep them in the same school that they were in if that's possible. Uh, while I was in foster care, I was moved from shelters that were in Seattle all the way up to Lake City. And you, no matter where I was, I was still attending my one high school in Federal Way. It was pretty difficult because there wasn't always transportation set up for me. We um, want to see the academic success of young people, and particularly those in foster care. Um, 
but a young person might not be able to focus on their finals when they don't know where they're going to live at next week, right? Um, they may not necessarily be able to pay attention, about, you know, make it to that class um, when they don't feel safe, um, you know, outside of the school place, right? You know, they're, they're, they're worried about their safety. I would also say to really prioritize school as a positive, stabilizing, protective factor for students who are experiencing foster care. Because I am a Muckleshoot tribal member, we do have our own high school. It's pretty much the best of both worlds because I was able to attend high school while staying true to who I am as a Native woman, Indigenous person. I was busing on, the, on, the, on public transportation in the morning for two hours all the way to school and then two hours back after school. I was never late uh, to school. I rarely ever missed anything. Um, the first thing was to graduate from high school, which I did. Um, wanted to go to community college, and I did it. Uh, graduating from community college and going to a university is definitely a dream come true, and I wouldn't be able if it wasn't for foster care get them involved in anything that, is, that sparks their interests and their passion so that they can really you know, develop their identity, talents, skills, sense of, you know, sense of who they are. And because uh, I wanted to go to this one school and I didn't want to miss out on having those like high school friendships that everyone has and building relationships with people in your school, I um, kind of made my own transportation to get there. I applied for a few different schools and landed on Central Washington University. I have been there now for three years. I'm going on my senior year right now. Um, I'm majoring in the apparel, textiles, and merchandising program with a minor in communication. I think school is very important. I think going to high school is a very beneficial experience. I don't necessarily believe that everyone has to go to high school and then go to college. For me, one of the hardest things I've ever done in my, in my life is graduate from high school. And when I did that, I was so relieved to be able to, be able to say that I'd gotten through it. No, no matter what I went through or how I did it, I got through high school and I graduated. And for me, that was all that I needed. You know, I find that when I am in rooms um, of, uh, it, that are education focused, I'm the only one talking about young people in foster care. And when I'm in foster care, child welfare related rooms, I'm the only one talking about education. That's why Treehouse works at the intersection of these two systems um, to help them work more effectively on behalf of our young people. Well, there's a disparity, right, in the services that one, rece one, that one receives, right? During my time as an education specialist, I saw firsthand um, that, you know, when I was working in schools in, you know, um, South Seattle area like, you know, Rainier Beach and Aki Karosi, right, um, working to get my young people's um, academic needs met, whether it be through I IEP or a 504, um, there was a, a lack of willingness to provide those resources, there was a lack of willingness to provide those accommodations, um, and I don't think there's any fault of the, of the of the administration, it's just the lack of resources, it's the lack of ability, the lack of capacity that folks have to be able to provide our young people with the supports they need. As opposed to when you go to some other areas um, that are more affluent, that do have more resources, that can provide um, some of that one-on-one -on -one support for young people. We need to make sure that school is a welcoming, inclusive environment for our BIPOC and LGBTQ youth. Lots of work to be done um, on, uh, on trauma-informed practice, on addressing everyday microaggressions that they experience. Making sure that our BIPOC and LGBTQ youth are placed with caregivers who affirm their identities and support not only their educational but their social emotional well-being. I graduated at the top of my class and because of all of the opportunities that I've gotten from being in foster care, I've received a lot of support and 
um, pretty much acknowledgement for the work that I've put into being who I want to be. So, you know, when we're thinking about changes that really need to happen, um, first and foremost, we need to listen to our young people. They have the answers and the solutions. You know, I have never met a stronger, more resilient bunch of young people. They have the wisdom that would tell us what to do. In 10 years, I hope that they're is no need for foster families. I hope that, you know, every child that is in the system is reunited with their families, but also to stay in a unity with them. That there's nothing that can tear that family apart. I think that foster parents should be a support team. I feel like a lot of foster parents get stuck on the parent part of being a foster parent and want to, um, become a parent for the kids that they take in, and not every kid needs a parent. There's definitely no not easy way um, of being a foster um, care parent, but it, it it is truly truly a blessing to have um, to have that support. And I'm gonna say patience is it's the key. All I ever wanted was for someone to see me and to support me, and realize that what I'd been through was difficult, and to be there when I needed them. That's what I needed. I never needed someone to coddle me or take care of me because I already knew how to take care of myself. One of the most urgent things that I would suggest is keeping siblings together. Um, there were moments in times where me and my siblings were separated and when you are separated in the system, you don't necessarily get to stay in communication with your siblings. You don't know which family they're staying with, if they're staying with anybody. And so that's something that I would definitely fight for and urge other people to acknowledge because I know that even though all of the difficult things that I faced, I had my siblings with me and it was like my own support system. We need to allow people um, who have diverse experiences into positions of power. I think is a really, really big um, Piece and also putting them in positions of power with support, right? Making sure that they have the, the tools, the skills, the resources they need to be successful, but recognizing that those are the people who have a be the best idea around what our young people and our kids need. I think uh, we need to hear from people that have been in the system, experienced the system, lived through the system. We need to hear from parents that lost their children, parents that got their children back and are raising them and they're successful. We really need to understand that uh, every youth, but these youth specifically, have endured a lot of things that no young person should ever endure. So how are we protecting them? How are we honoring those feelings? How are we keeping them safe? I hope that there are more preventative measures for adults or even children. Um, starting at the root, I know, I don't believe that every parent who has children in foster care is a bad person. Um, they could be a um, result of generational trauma and if there's more support for them to reach out to them and help them get their life back together so they don't have to face these, ta face these challenges of having their children taken away or, you know, I believe start at the root of the problem, help the adults before they decide they want to have children. Well, I mean, my hope in 10 years and 50 years is to not have a system at all. Like, it would be great if we had loving families for these, um, these kids, for these young adults. Um, 10 years, I would love to see people that have experienced foster care, like I said, mothers who have lost children and got them back, um, speaking up, you know, having, holding positions of power. And I think that if we can amplify the voices that have been quieted, I think that will help change the system. But we need people that will listen. The most effective thing that we can do to reduce the number of kids coming into foster care is to support the families that they're in where they are right now. The Family First Prevention and Services Act, which uh, Senator Murray was a huge push on, will make a huge difference in giving us federal money to match the state money to prevent on evidence-based prevention stuff, which I'm excited about. It will, it will reduce child poverty by half in Washington. A little bit of extra money makes families a lot more secure and making sure that when we have relatives that are caring for kids, that they're getting the same financial support 
that we would give to strangers who are often a lot less likely to be a family of color. How do we get those young people back into their communities and how do we get them back with their families? Um, I think that that's just so critical and so crucial. And, um, you know, once we see, once we start to focus in that space and bring people in with lived expertise, we'll see our families getting, be, we'll see our families coming back together. We'll see our families get reunified. And I'd also be remiss in saying that there's a certain amount of healing that needs to be done in our communities, right? Um, to build back trust and to build back um, our trust in systems. A lot of the work that I had to do happened behind the scenes, um, seeking support and you know wanting to be the best version of myself had to come from within. So the empowerment came from really not having my biological parents there with me um, going through life. And I know that it's different to not have a family but I use that fuel and, you know, hurt and heartbreak to push forward and take charge of my own destiny. I wanted to achieve something different in my community. I wanted to do something bigger than that, help people. I want people to succeed and I want to make an impact. That's the reason why I'm pursuing social work. Uh, I was given that choice and I chose to stay in foster care because for me specifically uh, being in foster care was more beneficial to my growth than being in the home that I had previously been in. So I had a lot more freedom to be who I was in foster care even though it was still challenging and difficult because of the way the system works. Being in foster care doesn't make you any less of a person from your friends or uh, family members who are born into homes where trauma isn't endured or they have both of their parents. If you have a story that is difficult and you think that you can't overcome what has been said upon you or spoken over your life, I would say use that as determination to change the course of your life. Um, I think there's something beautiful about having a unique story of being in foster care. Um, and so there's a lot of different things that you can do to change it. I know it's difficult, but I believe each person can get through all of the hurt and trauma that they've endured in foster care if that's the case.